Welcome everyone to today's program. I'm Shannon Barnett with Becker's Healthcare. The program today will begin with a presentation and we will have a question and answer session following completion of the pr presentation. You can submit any questions you have throughout the presentation by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. Our presenters will attempt to answer as many questions as they can during the time that we have and will follow up on questions we do not have the opportunity to address. You will receive an email within about a week following the webinar that will include instructions for how you can download a copy of the presentation. You will also receive a follow-up email shortly after completion of the program. You can submit your feedback or any additional questions at that time. This email will not include the presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. Tom Jacobs is the CEO of MedHQ and an ASC administrator with enthusiasm for transforming the healthcare employment model through more effective people management. He co-founded MedHQ nearly 12 years ago with the goal of delivering back office best practices and innovative solutions. Prior to co-founding MedHQ, Tom served over 15 years in professional engineering for nuclear power, enterprise information systems, and digital market marketing agencies. He has an electronic, uh, electrical engineering degree from Iowa State University and an MBA from the University of Notre Dame. Greg Martin is the Vice President of Highland Group Incorporated. Greg has over 30 years of employee benefit experience. For the last 27 years, he has brokered and consulted with corporate clients throughout the United States for the Highland Group. His clients have included both private and public companies, and he has extensive experience with bargained arrangement plans. Mr. Martin is experienced with a wide array of funding arrangements and has and had been integral to the design of employee benefit programs. Prior to joining Highland Group, he was in human resources with the Gen Air Corporation for six years. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Tom to begin today's presentation. Thank you, Shannon, and thanks to everybody for joining us on this webinar. Uh, early on when I got into the surgery center business, it was taught to me that surgery centers really have a very simple business model and simple strategy. It's one of the reasons, quite frankly, they're an attractive investment for many people. Uh, but success in, a, in the surgery center business then isn't so much about uh, differentiation and strategy. It's really about execution. Employee benefit, employee benefit plans, that is, are an example of this. There's nothing unique about offering uh, a high quality health plan to your staff, it's pretty much a given in, in uh, healthcare uh, that employees are in the, in the competition for labor or the competition for employees between providers, a high quality benefit plan is, is really a, a necessary feature. So the difference is in the details, the difference is in um, what, what uh, maybe creative ways we can bring to bear to uh, deliver a health plan that has an advantage uh, for our businesses. So this presentation is going to be primarily about the future, primarily about looking forward, and what are some ways we should be thinking about uh, addressing our health plan um, in, the, in the time period coming, coming up. Next slide, please. So we're going to address the presentation in, in four areas. Uh, number one is, we heard the old adage, if you can't measure it, then you can't manage it. That's kind of a problem with especially small group, group health plans, so we're going to talk about that a little bit. Price transparency is, is a uh, coming necessity in healthcare. Um, many surgery centers, uh, Becker's ASC Review had an article last week about 14 surgery centers and what they were doing in terms of price transparency. So it's certainly uh, an aspect that we can leverage in this health plan area. Um, sometimes there are investments we can make in our health plan uh, that actually end up paying off in terms of savings down the road. We'll talk about that a little bit. And we'll talk about wellness programs and how they work and what features we think are important for those plans. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the small group health plans. Um, Greg, you've seen a lot of plans uh, for small groups. What do they offer in terms of transparency and information about what's happening in the plan? 
Well, what is found typically, Tom, is uh, at best most small groups, and I'm talking about groups of less than 100 lives, it is typical that they will see either no information about what's going on within their plan, or if they get any information at all, depending on what state they live in, primarily dictated by legislature, uh, they may get rudiment information regarding what they've paid in premium versus what has been paid in claims. But if a group, uh, especially a small group plan, possibly is community rated, they will see no information. Uh, typically, if they are with an HMO, again, no information. So at best, it's extremely limited and done on the macro basis rather than being able to dig into the details. Absolutely. So for fully insured plans, for HMO products, you know, very little transparency. But for the typical surgery center, uh, total annual spend is, is somewhere in the neighborhood, neighborhood of $180,000. Uh, quite a bit of expenditure that uh, we're forced into the so-called hope and praise uh, management strategy. Uh, it's really something that is frustrating to a lot of us. And um, so that's, again, what we're trying to look at here is what are some things we should try to do about this uh, situation. Uh, with health plans, uh, costs where they are having nearly tripled or, or something like that in the last 15 years. And isn't that right, Greg? Yes, it is. I think everyone probably recognizes there seems to be three areas in particular that kind of operate separately from anything else in our economy. Uh, the cost of education, the cost of energy, even though we're getting a temporary reprieve. I'm not sure anyone would be convinced that uh, those prices are going to stay down where they are. And then health care. Uh, health care is doubling about every six years right now, and we don't really see that health curve changing. Uh, I think some of the things that we need to look at and we need to understand is how is your plan functioning? Uh, if there, And I'm sure there are individuals that are responsible for purchasing your health plans on this call. Uh, you are probably used to having your broker or consultant come in once a year at renewal and indicate, well, you know, inflation's up about 6% or 10% or whatever that number might be. And then on top of that, you know, the carrier didn't have a very good year, and so uh, here's your increase of 15 or 20%, and that's all the detail that you get. Uh, and so you find yourself on a treadmill that's very, very frustrating because you'll ask questions, well, are we doing well, or were we a poor group, or how do we know, what can we do, and how can we begin to address what's going on in our plan if we can't find out any details about our plan? That's right. And so with very little information about a plan, how a plan actually works, uh, very little detailed information that helps to decide whether your plan is going well or going poorly, except as Greg mentioned, at year end when, when you get that renewal uh, package, which has very little information in it. Uh, we're looking for real solutions that will help us address this condition. Uh, next slide, please. So what we have here is an example of what we have in our surgery centers. We typically measure key performance indicators. Uh, it's best practice. Uh, now, these indicators I'm showing here don't represent any specific surgery center. They're kind of a combination of a bunch of centers that we work with. Um, but what these KPIs show and what, what we can do with them, when we measure them and report them on a regular basis, they can give us clues to highlight areas of strength as well as areas of concern. For example, the labor hours worked and paid, those are the indicators on the upper left uh, column, uh, look fine for a typical multi-specialty surgery center with maybe a case mix of GI, ortho, uh, ophthalmology, general surgery, et cetera. And in the middle column, we see net operating profit is healthy. That's a good thing. However, if we look at the statistics on the right, uh, we see that there might be an issue with the revenue cycle, taking nine days from the data service on average to post charges, 53 days to collect. So using KPIs as a starting point, management can then investigate the reasons and if there is indeed room for improvement, management can begin taking action. Uh, also with areas of strength, management can report the good news to everybody 
and that in itself strengthens the condition, the situation for that surgery center. So the important thing to note, however, is that we have access to this information, and we report on it on a regular basis, not simply annually, and so we can use this information to make uh, management actions to improve our situation. Next slide, please. So what if we had something like this? Um, these are KPIs for a, uh, again, it, this is really a, a case study. Now, we didn't use actual numbers, but we've implemented this. Uh, MedHQ has implemented this for a network of surgery centers where we've set up a, a type of health plan where we have access to detailed information, and we can share this information with the surgery centers that are in this network on a monthly basis. So some of the notable, notable pieces um, that might you know, catch our eye include the following. We see on the left-hand side that network participation is 100% in network. That clearly shows that uh, the network is, is, is good. The employees are able to access the care that they want and need and with, with providers in the network. Um, in the, in the uh, center column, we see a generic dis drug dispensing rate is at 85%. And uh, that also is very strong. So we like to see a good healthy number there. And that indicates that our um, prescription drugs are under control. On the uh, right-hand side, we see that the average network discount is healthy, a 45% uh, discount. We like to see that number in that in that area. That's a very good number. However, in the middle column, in the upper middle column, we know in an area of concern. We see that um, per employee per month medical expenses at $710 is quite a bit in uh, higher than it was in 2014 at $565. So having access to this information now, we can pinpoint some areas that we want to might try to address the situation and, um, and uh, bring those costs under control. Now, Greg, what have you seen in terms of, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, this is probably information that none of you have had an opportunity to see from your carrier before. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it is typical that they come in with a renewal and they'll show you the current rates and the new rates and they won't give you much behind that. And so again, you're feeling frustrated. It's kind of like, gosh darn, you know, did we have a good year? Did we have a bad year again? Uh, the expense of this has gotten to the point for organizations like yours where this is probably the number two or number three line item on your profit and loss statements. Uh, salaries, sometimes equipment or buildings might be ahead of that, but this is a very, very big part of the expense of running your business. And so it needs to be managed like any other part of your business. So this doesn't take over and get out of control and cause your business to have to make cuts elsewhere to be able to maintain a decent health program that you can offer to your employees. Uh, today, as I mentioned, it's not uncommon for groups of less than 100 lives that are fully insured that they get little to no information. However, we are starting to see certain market segments where they are beginning to offer what we call level-funded premium products, which go down to as little as 15 lives in a group that look and smell a lot like a fully insured plan. Much of you are probably under that where based on the number of singles or the number of families you have, time or rate, that's what you send in for your premium. But what these plans will actually do is a, what's called level funding is they will report to you on a monthly basis what you paid in as far as premium dollars and what you paid out as far as claim dollars. And then we can begin to delve into where are those claim dollars being spent just like Tom is illustrating on this slide. Uh, if we can begin to pick up trends, maybe we need to do an education. Maybe our in-network charges are not 100% as is shown on here, but possibly they're 75%. Well, how are we getting 25% that are leaking outside of the network? Do we need a new network? Do we need a better network? Do we need better education of the employees so they know that they have a better benefit by going in-network? Likewise with generic drugs. Uh, 
what opportunities do we have there to capture savings, either at the retail or possibly even mail order for someone that might be on maintenance drugs. Does that make sense for them? So it is becoming more prevalent that we are able to get these kind of numbers and start talking to smaller groups as many groups have really kind of gotten to that uh, what if point of what if I just got out of this business and I didn't provide benefits at all. Uh, and I think that's a very scary proposition for a lot of folks, but they're very, very frustrated with the cost. And if we can start to dismantle it and see what's comprising our cost, then we can begin to address it and hopefully get control of it. Thanks, Greg. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the problems is that the Affordable Care Act really was a missed opportunity in this regard. It, uh, it didn't require carriers to do anything about this transparency issue. In fact, they let it stay in place, so it kind of uh, uh, it continued the problem. So these are situations like with Greg's example of level funding. Uh, what MedHQ did, we, we went out and we found uh, an, an arrangement that gave us this transparency. You have to go out and look for these things. Um, they're not going to be available as the typical small group fully insured plan. Uh, what we did in our plan is, is uh, we went to Blue Cross Blue Shield Illinois and, and uh, we're, we have a, a, a certain structure of our service where it's staffing and, and, and so we were able to do an administrative services only contract with them and unbundle the financing, et cetera, from the, from the, um, from the insurance. So, Again, now we can start to show plan performance data on a monthly or quarterly basis and uh, use that information in a proper way to help manage our plans. Next slide, please. So it's part of most surgery centers' value proposition uh, to their local community to be the high quality and low cost option. And as we mentioned earlier, there are several surgery centers right now opening up their price list. And it's kind of scary, yes, but um, it's a trend, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, you know, the beginnings of a trend maybe uh, that uh, will happen in healthcare. But it's a natural fit for surgery centers because there is that high quality uh, situation combined with a, with a low cost opportunity. So Greg, what are some of the, what are, what are the uh, source of, the plan, I'm sorry, what are some of the plan services you've seen that help participants shop for best, uh, for the best quality and best price uh, care? There is a lot of emerging technology and companies that are beginning to recognize the fault of our delivery system today. Uh, unfortunately, it's not like being able to go onto consumer reports and say, I want to buy the uh, Ford Taurus or the Ford Mustang. And how does that compare to other cars safety-wise, quality-wise, price-wise? What can I expect to negotiate? So what is happening is we're beginning to find a lot of vendors are coming into the marketplace and they're developing concierge services. Uh, services, for example, where you can call up. There's a company called Compass uh, with the idea that they're going to, as a Compass, direct you through the system, including even identifying physicians for you, identifying places to go for that type of service. Uh, things that are being developed are certainly centers of excellence, places that are routinely doing transplants, for example, very high cost. But you know, where is the most effective and cost efficient place to go? Quality place. It can't just be about the cheapest. That's not what the goal is. It's to get the best care possible. So we have centers of excellence. We have, there's a new tool out. Uh, it's been out for a couple years called Healthcare Blue Book. And the Healthcare Blue Book will actually help identify for your geographic area, uh, say someone needs an MRI, uh, where is the best place for an MRI? Now, Tom mentioned that MedHQ uses Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois as their carrier. Well, even within Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois' network, there are some places that are better and better priced than others. And so this kind of tool would allow you to go in and say, I need an MRI, this is my zip code, this is how far I'm willing to drive, and it will produce a list of alternatives that you can then investigate. And ultimately, they're still all in network, 
but you can decide then, especially if you're in a high deductible health plan or an HSA plan, a health savings account type plan, where you are spending your dollars, in many cases up front, you want to get the biggest bang for your dollar. The other area that we're seeing this being addressed in, Tom, is we're seeing what's called more uh, narrow, high-performance networks, almost like a network within a network that, again, would say that uh, I happen to know very well a case where uh, people in Dallas are actually driving to Oklahoma City to get treated for orthopedic procedures. Uh, there is a center up there that has uh, great, great outcomes and they have gone to where they are actually doing case rates for this. And so those are just some of the ways that consumers are being educated and given an opportunity to say, I don't have to just blindly follow the network or just depend on word of mouth. I can now find reliable resources to help direct me through the process. That's great. Next slide, please. So in addition to giving all this information about uh, high quality care and, uh, and, and uh, at the best cost, uh, these companies also help from an administrative standpoint. They help um, in, uh, members of plans, employees decipher medical bills. They help them uh, maybe audit what happened and, and make sure things get uh, corrected if there are problems. Uh, some of them even help book doctor appointments. Um, so there are a number of things that these solutions offer, even to kind of the basic um, employee service, customer service kind of arrangements, uh, and, and we find them, you know, to be very attractive. Uh, next slide, please. So does your health plan reflect the commitment to consumer choice? High deductible and other so-called consumer-directed health plans are widely viewed as being effective and effective strategy for controlling cost. Uh, they've really grown from uh, just a few percentage points of, of participation across the country to now in the almost one-fourth of, 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 of plan members are choosing consumer-directed plans uh, in some areas. So again, combining this, um, this consumer-directed plan with the price transparency, we're also incentivizing people to to be a participant in managing the cost of their care by giving them incentives to shop. Uh, next slide, please. Some examples that uh, can help you save money. Uh, what we're using here at the top of them would be an example of medication compliance services. Uh, what that is, and some of you may already be uh, experiencing some of these type programs, but for example, diabetes. Uh, it has been shown that a controlled diabetic is going to cost about 25% of an uncontrolled diabetic. And so many plans are developing programs where once someone is identified with diabetes, there may be financial incentives in there. There's going to be uh, individuals. For example, I know some carriers have staffs of nurses that will reach out to the individual with the diabetes and say, do you understand you know, what's going on with your disease state? Uh, sometimes people feel like they're a little rushed when they're in a doctor's appointment and come out and they'll go, well, I got a prescription, but I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do here. These type of programs will help those individuals, and if they stay compliant, they're taking their drugs, they're getting their uh, feet checked, they're having the eye exam once a year. Many plans are building in incentives that will say, as long as you're doing that, for example, we will pay for all of your diabetic supplies, drugs, and other test strips, meters, whatever else might be included in this, to encourage that person to stay in that state of compliance rather than getting out of compliance. And as you know there, then there are very, very many comorbidities uh, that can be incurred, hospitalizations, uh, other things that take place that can cause that cost of care to go up tremendously. So that's just one type of an example. Uh, some other strategies for reallocating the health plan administrative expenses. We've touched on some of these, uh, being the advocacy services that are being developed out there today to help people steer through. Uh, it could be a question as much as, hey, my child's going to school in California and I live in Illinois. 
Uh, what do I have to do there? You know, do I need a different card? Uh, how will they, you know, uh, access healthcare? Uh, so things like Compass, Healthcare Blue Book. Uh, there is even an, an emerging market for what's called domestic medical tourism. Uh, I kind of spoke of Oklahoma City being a, a place that's very well known for orthopedic work. Uh, I'm not sure how, how or why they developed that, but they did. Uh, but there are other places around the country, again, that have developed a very, very niche for themselves. And, and what they're willing to do, because they are very good at it, their outcomes are very, very good, uh, they have been identified and folks are beginning to say, hey, we'll pay for your hotel, we'll pay for your plane, we'll pay for your family to go there if you're able to do so because of the type of savings that can be achieved out of those kind of arrangements. Next slide, please. A lot of these features that we're talking about, engaging employees, engaging staff, engaging plan members, falls under the umbrella of wellness programs. So we'll talk a little bit about wellness programs. But uh, in this, under this umbrella, we're really trying to build a culture of health, culture of wellness in your surgery centers. However, there are certain Affordable Care Act rules, wellness rules that are contained within the Affordable Care Act. And then there are also some things going on in the EEOC which counterbalance some of the rules in the Affordable Care Act. Greg, can you talk a little bit about the specific rules that, that the uh, new health care law has put in place? Sure. Uh, so everyone is aware uh, when we're talking PAPACA or you've heard it referred to as ACA or you probably more commonly have heard it referred to as Obamacare. Uh, what that law has done is it has expanded the requirements for wellness. And for example, most folks probably don't realize that under the requirements of PAPACA or ACA, uh, everyone is entitled to an annual physical. Uh, there are wellness benefits for children, including dental care that is found in PAPACA. Uh, there are lots of incentives that have been built into the law, trying again to encourage people to take ownership of their health and stay healthy, not just get healthy, but stay healthy. And what they have built into the law that allows for some of that is they have allowed, and some of you again may have experienced this, others maybe not, the law actually says that if you are a willing participant in these plans versus someone who is unwilling to participate in these plans, there can be a difference in premium spread as, of as much as 30%. So let's say you are a willing participant in a wellness program, and it doesn't mean that you have to suddenly become skinny like a model. Uh, I can tell you, I, I like to refer to myself to my wife, I think I am pleasingly plump. Uh, but if I am able to participate in these plans, I qualify the same as someone who is naturally thin, uh, has great blood pressure, all those things are terrific, and I let's say I'm just a little outside of that. If I'm participating, I get the same premium as that person who naturally is able to achieve that. But it means I've got to do a little extra work and I have to participate in the program, and if I don't, then that same premium that is being charged $100 for the healthy person, if I say, hey, I'm just not going to play by the rules and I don't want to participate, you as an employer could actually charge that employee 30% more, or in this case, $30 more for their coverage than the person that does participate. And to further encourage that, uh, one of the things that they have determined is a real taboo out there is tobacco. And in the case of tobacco use, if you are a non-tobacco user and you are being charged $100 for your insurance, the spread that can occur there is 50%. So someone that says, I'm just not going to quit. I enjoy my pipe or my cigar or cigarettes or whatever it might be or, you know, whatever part of the country. It might be dip if you're in the southern part. Uh, Texas does that a lot. Uh, that spread would be and would cost you $150 versus the $100. So there are lots of benefits in the ACA Act in regard to wellness, and most folks don't realize that. They're kind of shocked when they find out that these things, including immunizations, like I said, physicals, uh, some pediatric dental coverage, but they're out there and they're there to encourage 
the improvement and maintenance of good health. Thomas? Thanks, Greg. Uh, so while all this is going on in the Affordable Care Act, the EEOC, you know, as you listen to Greg and you can have these differences differences between cost for one person, person versus another, it's kind of natural territory for the EEOC to step in and say, wait a minute, let's make sure, you know, we're not unfairly discriminating from one person versus the next. So they've actually filed suit against uh, some larger companies uh, to and, and we're all waiting to see how this is going to play out. So there's more to come about this, but I think the the, the essence of the story at this point is that um, there is certainly support for wellness programs and wellness uh, concepts inside of health plans, both from a federal government standpoint and in the carrier uh, world. And uh, so now is the time to really look at wellness programs as, as an opportunity right now to uh, get started in this area. Next slide, please. Professional care management is the most critical part of a wellness program. In English, what that means is that if we can identify certain disease states, and the most common ones are asthma, diabetes, COPD, CHF, uh, cancer cases, those, those are, that's not a disease state as much as it is a disease, uh, but all these programs offer opportunity for assistance to that individual as to how they can best navigate the benefit program. And, and so they create opportunities for education. It creates opportunities to help not only the individual that's incurring this, but also their family, their dependents. Where do they look for help? And so uh, many carriers are employing nurses that have the ability and they've been taught not only to treat disease but also to talk to people for example with diabetes you know uh, how can you change your lifestyle how can you do these things to make it better so you find your health and, and your disease state managed and so there's a lot of tangible assets to having these individuals available because they don't always have the ability to spend a half hour or 45 minutes with their physician. Uh, when we talk about the 90-10 is the new 80-20, uh, I'm sure everyone has always heard the rule that, uh, you know, 80% of our dollars are spent on 20% of our population. That's those folks that tend to have these, these disease states that we have spoke about. That has really kind of shifted now. Today, more the norm is it's about 90% of the dollars are being spent on 10% of the population. Uh, many of you may be familiar with a new, you've seen the commercials for a new uh, hepatitis C drug. And in the past, hepatitis C wasn't necessarily uh, easily treatable. And now, if you can get that drug, uh, it, depending on the dosage that you have to take and the length of time you have to take it, that drug is costing between two hundred and four hundred thousand dollars just for a drug for Hep C. Now it's a tremendous, you know, success as far as being able to treat these people with this horrible condition, but it's at a very very steep cost. And so programs to, such as uh, care management are identifying opportunities through specialty pharmacy where additional discounts can be found for those type of drugs. But it's generally a very small part of the population that's taking the bulk of the dollars. And if we can identify those folks either through an office visit or possibly sometimes even we don't even know that they've got something until there is a drug that has been prescribed it gives an opportunity to reach out and hopefully improve not only uh, their life but also the financial standing of the program. Thank you. Next slide, please. So again, back to the point is where it sounds like we're pinpointing one, maybe two individuals and you know that's sort of the nature of it. However, we want to make sure then that our wellness program doesn't um, come across that way. We want our wellness program to really uh, be there for everybody in your in your organizations. It should be a total employment-based participation um, for the wellness program. Now, inside the wellness program, there may be some specific individuals that need some extra help, but um, but the plan itself, the wellness plan, and all the different activities uh, should be embraced by everybody in the organization. 
Uh, next slide, please. So just to kind of get to the point and, and emphasize the, the, the dollars and cents of it, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, a typical surgery center with the, both the employee portion and the employer portion of the cost might be spending $180,000 per year. There might be 15 employees on the plan, uh, 27 total members. So that $180,000 is typical to see a target medical loss ratio of 80%. That's 144000 in this example. So using our 90-10 rule, there might be two or three of the plan members that account for 90% of the cost. Next slide, please. So with those two or three plan members, 90% comes out to just under 130000 So if there are two or three episodes of care throughout the plan year, simply a 5 or 20% or savings in these episodes can have a significant impact on your claims and on your medical loss ratio for the year. Uh, $6,000 to $25,000 is 3 to 12% of the claims uh, for that year. Next slide, please. So with that, we're going to wrap it up here with just some other thoughts on other concepts that you might hear in the marketplace. Uh, number one, private exchanges and defined benefit programs. Um, my beef with those is they still don't unwrap the present, so to speak. They still keep that information about what's happening in a plan um, under wraps. Uh, Greg, can you talk, explain what those plans are all about and kind of how they work? The uh, defined benefit programs. Tom? Yeah, yeah, and the private exchanges that are being developed. Yeah, sure. Uh, in insurance, what they're talking about with private exchanges is they're talking about insurance companies developing a pool for small employers to come and purchase their benefits from. And in insurance, what always works and what our entire industry is based on is the law of large numbers. And so what they're hoping to do with the private exchanges, because there is no longer uh, pre-existing conditions that can be eliminated. People cannot be prevented from buying insurance. What they're hoping to do is to pull enough people into those exchanges that they've been able to spread the risk. Uh, you've probably heard of, you know, bronze plans, gold plans, platinum plans, uh, and, and you can associate costs that go with each of those and, and what might happen and with each one of those being a little better plan. But basically, in simplest term, it, it's an aggregation of hopefully a lot of different individuals and or small employers that are coming into these exchanges to be able to use that power of large numbers to negotiate where otherwise they would not have that opportunity standing alone as a single individual or a five life group or maybe a 25 life group. Thank you, Greg. And, and so, you know, the other areas that we see happening in the, in the marketplace are, and Greg talked about this a little bit earlier, specialty markets, there are specialty networks, uh, ACO strategies, I think, somewhat fall into this category. Uh, we could spend a whole another hour talking about uh, ACO strategies, so that's kind of beyond the scope of this. And I know surgery center managers are keeping the ear to the ground about about how they're going to participate in the in their ACOs in their in their areas, so we won't necessarily get into that. But there are a number of things that are happening in the market that that um, again, looking forward, uh, hopefully we've given you some concepts that we can uh, pay attention to and, and look into and perhaps embrace in the in the months and uh, and years ahead about how to address uh, health plan cost. Next slide, please. So running your health plan the way you'd run your surgery center's profit and loss, we think is a, is, one, is a very effective way to start looking at keeping your uh, costs under control and doing something about the spiraling um, nature of health, health insurance these days. And with that, we'll open it up for questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Tom and Greg, for a very informative and enjoyable presentation. We will now begin the Q&A portion of the program. 
As a reminder, you can submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. Our presenters will attempt to answer as many questions as they can during the time we have for the Q&A. We'll follow up with questions they do not have the opportunity to address. All right, so starting off here, the first question we have uh, from the audience. Um, could you please discuss a little more about the types of arrangements and associations surgery center businesses can participate in that would give them access to, health, uh, to these health plan arrangements? Sure, I guess I can start off by just talking about um, professional employer organizations or PEOs, um, healthcare staffing companies. Uh, these are two two ways that MedHQ participates in these things. And there are a number of businesses in that market now. The, cert the PEO industry has been in existence for about 30 years, um, somewhat coinciding with the uh, surgery center marketplace. And that's just one way that um, surgery centers and other small businesses are able to tap into uh, new arrangements right now. Um, Greg, do you have any more uh, thoughts on that? No, I think you've covered it pretty well, Tom. Uh, the one thing I could just tell everybody is that the landscape in healthcare benefits is changing on almost a daily basis. Uh, folks are looking for new ways to bring alternatives to to their businesses, to their employees. Uh, you know, there's been conversation in the past that, well, one day we'll all just shop individually. Uh, I think employers know that employees depend upon them being their avenue to benefits. There's, there's a sense of uh, comfort in, in having that. So uh, I think we're going to continue to see groups look to, to aggregate when it's possible. They may be homogeneous groups. Uh, surgery centers, uh, or it may be individuals are going to these exchanges in hope of finding a better deal. But I, I, it, it's going to continue to evolve. Uh, we're going to see, you know, ACOs, Tom touched on them, uh, accountable care organizations, hospitals, uh, big physician practices are beginning to look at and say, hey, what, you know, we want to participate in the risk. And we're willing to do that, and they think that what they're going to be able to do is to participate in a reward along with that risk. So lots of changes. Wonderful. Thanks, guys. The next question we have is how do you engage the payers into the discussion along with the providers to get transparency? I'll, I'll start with uh, my thoughts on this. That's a great question. What we find is insurance companies, um, they have what they have, and they're not necessarily looking to be innovative. So it's really the employers and the advisors, such as Greg, who are looking to drive, drive home and drive the, the ship, so to speak, in terms of innovation. So I think as, as employers looking for new ways to structure your health plan, you have to take the ball and run with it yourself. You have to push, push, the, uh, push for those solutions. You have to really ask a lot of questions and get into the marketplace, find advisors like Greg that will help you along the way. But I think, I think it really starts with more with the uh, providers and the employers rather than the third-party payers. Yeah, I would add to that, Tom, uh, and, and I can't hear all of you, but I'm sure there would be a collective cheer as I say this. Uh, providers are tired of dealing with insurance companies, <laughs> and, and they want to find a way to dispense their, their medical services and get paid as quickly as possible, and there's nothing wrong with that. And so many providers are saying, hey, if you can give me an avenue to do that to where I no longer have to be in the collection business, uh, they are gravitating and they are more than willing to say, I will cut a deal to do this. Uh, I think traditional networks that we've known, it's always kind of be, hey, give me the biggest, the baddest, the best. And I'll just use it as an example, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Everybody tends to equate Blue Cross Blue Shield with, like I said, the biggest, the baddest, the broadest, the best. Uh, certainly it is the biggest, uh, it is the broadest, it's not always necessarily the best. And so uh, we're seeing a lot of hospitals. I'm working with a 13 hospital group in the state of Louisiana right now that is putting together an ACO. Uh, I'm working with a number of other entities that are looking likewise. They're looking to say, 
I don't have a problem publishing my rates. I'm uh, more than willing to do that as long as I don't have to go through all the hassle of credentialing with a network, of, of the constant paperwork and in the, in the process of trying to be a collection service in addition to dispensing medical services. So we're finding that providers are more than happy to have these discussions uh, as long as it leads to a streamlining of, of how they do their business. Wonderful. Uh, the next question we have is, um, don't high deductible plans put a lot of burden on the employee with potentially large out-of-pocket expenses? There is some element of that. If, if uh, plans don't account for uh, or don't, don't address that. And what I mean by that is the high deductible plans, we see them in terms of coupling them with either a health savings account or an HRA arrangement. Both the health savings account and the HRA arrangement allow for employers to offset some of that deductible through contributions to those areas. So there are ways that, that can be brought to bear to alleviate the the day-to-day -day expenses. Um, on the other hand, too, you know, cost of care is expensive. So um, the more we can educate employees about uh, about how to be most efficient, um, you know, we all have to be a part of this uh, a part of this uh, game, so to speak. And Tom, let me elaborate just a little bit more so everybody knows uh, what the definition of a high deductible health plan is under ACA. Uh, the minimum deductible to be considered a high deductible is $1,300 for a single person and $2,600 for a family. And the most that a deductible can be under a high deductible health plan is $6,450 for a single and $12,900 for a family. There's also a limit on the total out-of-pocket, which very closely approximates that deductible I just spoke about as a maximum. And so some of you may already be aware, some of you may have deductibles higher than that $1,300. You may be looking at two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000 deductibles already. So I think there's some misconception about what a high deductible health plan is and just what the total exposure is. Uh, is it for everyone? No. Uh, but I think it probably applies to more individuals than, than people readily accept. Great. Just as a reminder for, uh, to everyone, if you have any questions for Greg or Tom, you just type them into your control panel in the space labeled, enter a question for staff, and press send. Um, so thank you guys. Uh, the next question we have is, is it true that self-funded plan rates could decrease as the number of employees increase under the plan? What we found is that um, there's a you know, a, a few percentage, maybe 10%, somewhere between 0 and 10% difference in the long term being self-funded versus being fully insured. Um, and so, yes, it's true that the, uh, the uh, cost per employee could decrease as the number of employees increase in the following way. There are a number of fixed expenses that go with setting up a self-funded plan. And then there are variable expenses that go with a self-funded plan. The variable expenses are such things as claims processing um, versus fixed expenses such as the aggregate stop loss policy might be a, a fixed expense. So, so there are ways, there are certainly um, opportunities to save more money as the plan gets bigger. Uh, it also, as the plan is bigger, there's less unknown about the claims that are going to be incurred in any given plan year. And so your, your window of risk spread, so to speak, is, is thinner as you get into a, a bigger uh, group. All right, wonderful. Uh, the next question we have is, what do you think of exercise incentives, fun runs, and such activities as part of well plans? There are a couple of aspects I would think about when setting up a wellness plan and including provisions like that. Number one, it is good to engage everybody, as we talked about earlier. So you want to look for things that everybody can participate in. But ironically, you know, things like fun runs and, and those sorts of things, you've got to be a little bit careful about because, like ADA, what if there are some people in your staff that, you know what, they 
they did something to their knee years ago and they just can't do a fun run. Um, you don't want to find yourselves in the position of trying to do something good and yet creating a problem because of how it was set up. So you just need to be a little bit careful about what things you include in your formal wellness plan uh, so you can um, treat everybody fairly, part get everybody to participate, and at the same time achieve your, your objective, which is to um, minimize your plan cost. Wonderful. Greg, do you want to weigh in at all? Oh, I think Tom covered it pretty well. I think uh, anything you can do that will help encourage people to get healthy, I think, is a worthy effort. Uh, I've seen plans where people have uh, walks, uh, you know, just a number of different ways that you can do it. But I think, you know, there are softball leagues. There are all kinds of things that people can do. And, and again, anything that helps gets us up, gets us moving, gets us feeling better, uh, I think it's worthy to, to look at. Wonderful. Uh, the next question we have is, can you elaborate more about penalties um, in the PPAC? And, and do you see employers being proactive in um, implementing those penalties? Yeah, Tom, you want me to jump in first on this one? Sure, sure. Yeah, you know, we've always kind of heard, you know, is it a carrot or is it a stick that folks are using? And what the penalties are, I'm not sure it's penalties, is, is it could be looked at that way. It's, it's a surcharge. And basically what it is, is everyone must be given the opportunity to get as well as they can get. Now, I, I'll be very frank. Uh, I'll let everybody know. Uh, I am a diabetic. Uh, but because I do maintain, and uh, I'm proud to say my last A1C was 5.9, uh, I actually do receive all of my diabetic supplies for free. My plan allows for me to do that because I do stay compliant. But basically what the penalties are are financial penalties as far as what an employer can charge an employee for their premium in the event that they choose not to participate. Uh, for example, there are going to be certain people that others that might be diabetic that cannot achieve a 5.9 A1C, but yet they're still doing all the things that are required. They're going to the doctor. They're taking their drugs. They're taking, you know, uh, refilling their prescriptions. They're doing all those things they need to do. Well, they would qualify for the exact same premium that I qualify for then because sometimes just DNA is against us and says we can't make it any better than that. And the people that are going to get penalized are those, and, and I can tell you, in my career, uh, I had a very large international company uh, that offered a wellness program, and I'm talking back 15, almost 20 years ago that they started this. We had two individuals each year that when it came time for us to do a biometric screening, they absolutely refused to participate. And because of that, they paid a higher premium, but that was their choice, and they were willing to do so. So the penalties, it really comes down to, is it going to cost you additional premium because you're a smoker? The answer is going to be yes. If the employer wants to invoke it, they don't have to, but many, many employers that we're seeing today are really, if they're not on the verge of doing it, they're already taking advantage of these opportunities to say, hey, I, I'm paying as much as I can, and if you don't want to be healthy, you're going to have to participate in more of the cost. Thanks, guys. All right, well, it looks like uh, that is all the time that we have today. Um, I want to thank our presenters again for their excellent presentation, and for all of you for participating today. We look forward to having you join us for future webinars. This concludes today's program, and have a wonderful afternoon.